I just want to add my welcome to um, Joshua's welcome to everybody uh, who's here, everybody who's watching on the live stream, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, welcome and thanks for just making the time to, to spend with us this morning. Before I jump into Philippians, I have five Tim bits I want to share with you. And if you don't know what a Tim bit is, you should Google it and uh, you'll find out what a Tim bit is. But five things I want to share with you. Uh, the first one is, um, there's my, my cell phone number is up there. If you have a prayer request, um, you can text it in, one or two sentences, text that in to me uh, during the message, and at the end of the message, I'll take all those requests and we'll pray for them like we've done in the past. So text in your prayer request. That's the Tim, Tim bit number one. And then number two, since, uh, actually, I don't have to have this on, do I? There we go, okay. Josh was trying to get my attention back there, and I was trying to figure out, what's he doing, doing all those jumping jacks back there and stuff? Okay, now we got it. So anyway, during the coronavirus, I've been doing these PT dailies, two or three a week, and they've just been written, stuck up on, on the internet, but uh, last week I started recording them, videoing them, so now you can watch them, or you can read them, or if you want extra bonus, you can do watch and read together. I mean, so anyway, that's up there, just wanted you to know that. Um, the third Tim bit is about prayer. I really, really believe that God is calling us uh, as a church to pray. And, um, you know, I shouldn't have to tell you why. I've got to get this, excuse me, I've got to get this thing right here. Um, you know, some weeks this fits really good and other weeks it doesn't. I don't know why. Uh, but anyway, pray for our community and pray for our country because of these things like COVID-19, uh, all the racial tensions, the growing political divide, the November election coming up, and now all these fires. Uh, we have a lot to pray about. And this week... Uh, we have two opportunities where you can be a part of that. On Wednesday night here at 7 o'clock, we're going to have an in-person prayer meeting where you can actually come to the church uh, and pray together. Uh, we'll observe physical distancing. Uh, mass will be required. And uh, we'll do that in a safe way. But you can come on Wednesday night. And then on Friday and Saturday, we're going to observe 30 hours of prayer. On Friday and Saturday from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., half-hour slots so 30 divided times 2 is 60, 60 slots. Uh, you can sign up by calling the church office, or Joshua put a link this morning where you can electronically sign up when he sent out the link for the service, or for those of you who are here, you, outside the, the sanctuary doors there at the back, there's a sign-up sheet. And uh, I checked before the service, we had 17 out of the 60 spots filled. Uh, my goal is to get all 60 spots filled. Filled, and I hope we can do it. We should be able to do it. So um, I just want to call all of us to prayer on Wednesday night and Friday and Saturday. So that's Tim bit number three. Tim bit number four, uh, I just want to say a little bit more about house churches. Uh, we're hoping, like, like Don was saying, we can't all be together like we used to be. And uh, we miss each other. We miss that, that connection and that community. And so we want to break things down into what we're going to call house churches, small groups, but about eight adults, and uh, they'll meet together either over Zoom or in somebody's home. Uh, they'll discuss the morning message. Uh, you'll have discussion questions to do that. And then those groups will just, will just pray for one another and care for one another. Uh, that's what we have in mind. Now, you're going to see a picture up here of uh, a couple redwood trees, actually a, a grove of trees, and then one big tree. So these are redwoods. Uh, and uh, I learned something about redwood trees this week. You know, these trees grow two to 400 feet tall. And I've always thought they must have amazing root systems that go down into the ground, you know, a couple hundred feet or something like that. And what I found out this week is that the root system of redwood trees is totally different. They only go down about six or seven feet but they spread out up to 100 feet. And so when you have this grove of redwood trees, their roots intermingle and tie together, and they together provide stability for those trees so they can grow two, three, 400 feet tall. And when I, when I read about that, I thought, that's like a house church. A house church is a grove of redwood trees. 
where together as you lay your roots down by prayer and Scripture and meeting together, you, you provide a support system in which to grow strong and tall and sturdy and resilient. So I thought that was pretty cool to learn about those redwood trees and, and the metaphor that it can be for us uh, in our lives today. One more tidbit. And uh, the tidbit is about uh, Antonin Scalalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And you're going to see a picture of them uh, coming up. So, um, picture please. So, on the left, who's really on the right, but on the left is uh, Antonin Scalia. And we've all heard about him. He served on, on the Supreme Court as an associate justice from 1986 until he died in 2016. And he was looked upon as the intellectual anchor on the court for the conservatives. And then on the right, really on the left, is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who served as associate justice on the Supreme Court from, from uh, what was it, 1993 until just two days ago. And she was widely recognized, viewed as belonging to the left. Now, what we need to realize is that we in America have a lot we can learn from these two because they were best buddies. That's what Ruth Boehner Ginsburg called them. We are best buddies. Even though they passionately disagreed on almost every issue, they often voted opposite. Even though they had all of these differences, they were best buddies. They socialized together. Their families went on vacation together. And they model for us civility. They model for us how we can respect somebody who differs in, in, in viewpoints than what we do. And they remind us that it's possible to passionately disagree with somebody and still be friends. And isn't that what we need in our community, in our country, in our churches, and our families right now? And so I wanted to put that up uh, because, you know, they're both gone now. And who's going to take their place? Who's going to demonstrate that mutual respect and civility and friendship and socializing when there's such great, great philosophical differences? So we have a lot I think we can learn from these two. Tim Bits over. Let's jump into Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. This gets us to the end of chapter 2, halfway through the book. Uh, Gretchen already referenced uh, this, this section, but I'll read it for you. But I think it is necessary, Paul's writing to the Philippians, to send back to you Epaphroditus, Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. And therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, I want you to welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Three points that I, I want to share from these verses. So first of all, this is a picture of how the church as relationship works. These verses are a picture of how the church as relationship works. And as I've been saying the last couple of weeks, the church really is a vertical and a horizontal relationship. It's relational in nature. And so vertically, the church is all those people who are connected to God through Christ. And then there's the horizontal relationship, and that is that we are related to one another by virtue of our connection to God in Christ. 
And so what that does, that forms a cross. And, and the place where our relationship with God in Christ and the place where our relationship with each other meets is the cross. It's Christ. Christ who brings us together. And we see that happening here in this passage. So in Philippians chapter 2, you have Paul, you have the Philippians, you have Epaphroditus, and they're connected horizontally because of their connection vertically to God in Christ. So Paul, as you all know, if you've been listening the last few weeks, Paul is in Rome and he's in prison. And uh, in Roman culture, the, the government, the state, did not take care of their prisoners. A prisoner had to find friends or family or somebody who would take care of their necessities, who would bring them food, who would bring them water. And so Paul had this need of, uh, of he needed funding, he needed money in, in order to buy food. And so the Philippians, 800 miles away, found out about this, the church there, and they had the desire to help Paul and the means to help Paul, and so they raised some money to send to Paul, only Paul's 800 miles away, and who's going to take it? And I don't know how Epaphroditus was chosen, but Epaphroditus was the one who then took that money gift from the Philippian church to Paul in Rome, so Paul had some money uh, to buy food and, and whatever, his, whatever his needs were. Now, to step back from the story just a little bit, uh, you know, we read in Scripture that, that those who are called to lead in, in the kingdom of God, those who are called to preach, those who are called to lead like Paul, are to be supported by those they lead or by those they preach to or by those they pastor. And so, for instance, in 1 Timothy 5, 6, 17 through 18, uh, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For Scripture says, quoting Deuteronomy 25.4, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. While the ox is working, make sure you feed it. And so what the church in Philippi did in sending money to Paul through Papford. Pap Epaphroditus, I can't, <laughs> Epaphroditus, excuse me. What they did there, it, it hit the mark biblically. They were doing what they were supposed to do. And so when you, as a part of the church, when you give, guess what happens? We as staff get paid so we can pay our bills. And so your giving hits the mark biblically. So you give, and we on staff get a paycheck, like myself, Joshua, and Nick, and Rachel, and John and Kelly, and Melinda, and Alan are paid, and that's a good thing. And I want to thank you for that this morning. Um, think of our benevolent fund. Uh, which has been much harder to do when, when we're, we're in COVID. But normally on Communion Sundays, we take an offering. We call it the Benevolent Fund, the, the love offering. And it goes to people in our church community who have needs. And that fund is still being used. And lately, it's gone to pay for car repairs, funeral expenses, mortgage payment during furlough, monthly living expenses for those on a low income, and counseling. That's how some of that money has been spent. And then a few months ago, when, when our friends in Sierra Leone went into lockdown because of COVID, uh, Sam Cisse told me that, that they're in need of food. So we raised some money, $7,800. We wired it to Sam, and he was able to buy 150 bags of rice to distribute to people who were needing food to eat. And so that's one way that the church is relational when it comes down to those that have meeting the needs of those who may not have. And so my question for you is, who might you need to help this week? We're connected to God in Christ, and because of that, then we all are connected like this. And who has needs that you may know of that you may need to help meet them this week? That's the first point. 
And then secondly, what do we know about Epaphroditus? What do we know about this guy? And we don't know very much. He's only mentioned in Philippians chapter 2 and chapter 4, and that's it. So we don't know a lot about him. And uh, we, we know in verse 25 that, that Paul said, you know, he's my brother. We're related horizontally because of our connection in Christ. He's my brother. He's my co-worker. So Epaphroditus and Paul worked and served God together, served the Philippians together. He's my fellow soldier. I think that means that he's a hard worker. He took it seriously. And then the, the church in Philippians, he was their messenger. He, they, he, they entrusted him enough that they gave him this money and said, you're the kind of guy that can keep this money and, and make the 800-mile trip to, to Rome. And so he was held in high regard by those in the church in Philippi, or he wouldn't have been asked to do that. But then verses 27 and then 30. For Epaphroditus longs for all of you and is distressed, longs for all of you, those of you in Philippi, and he's distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. And so Epaphroditus was ill. And, and we have no way of knowing the nature of his illness because we're never told. We're never told what happened to him, just that he was ill. He almost died for the work of Christ, so he was severely, seriously ill. He just about didn't make it. And in the ancient world, when people were knocking on death's door, not very many of them survived that. But Epaphroditus did, and he risked his life. So his, his illness and his making that 800-mile trek to, to Rome put those together, and somehow that meant that he almost died. He risked his life. That's what we know about Epaph Epaphroditus. And then I want you to notice what Paul says next. He said, but God had mercy on him. This refers to God's direct hand in healing Epaphroditus. God had mercy on him. He didn't die. He survived. And so the mercy was God's direct hand of healing, and apart from God having mercy upon Epaphroditus, he wouldn't have made it. So there's an instance of healing where God healed him. And then notice what Paul said next. He goes, God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Epaphroditus' healing and mercy was not just for him, it was also for Paul, because his death would have meant more sorrow for Paul. Paul is already sorrowing because he's locked away in prison in Rome. That's hard. And then he says, if Paphroditus would have died, that just would have added to my sorrow. Here Paul is in the book of Philippians talking about sorrow when he mentions joy more in Philippians than he does in any other book. For instance, an example, chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, and because of this I rejoice, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. All throughout the book, Paul talks about joy. And yet now in chapter 2, he's talking about sorrow upon sorrow. And you kind of go, hmm, like, is it joy, Paul, or is it sorrow? Or is it joy and sorrow? I mean, what is it? And Gordon Fee, who writes just an amazing commentary on Philippians, says, joy does not mean the absence of sorrow, but the capacity to rejoice in the midst of it. Joy does not mean the absence of sorrow, but the capacity to rejoice in the midst of it. And over in 2 Corinthians, there's, there's a place where Paul says he's sorrowful, yet always joyful. Sorrowful, yet always joyful. And I think that's good news for us right now. I think that's very good news for us right now, that we can have joy in the midst of our sorrow, and, and there's so much going on in our country right now that brings us sorrow. But in the midst of that, it's possible to also have joy. And the way we have joy is by being in Christ and His life and His love and His care and His goodness 
in his presence in our lives is what gives us joy in the midst of sorrow. So in Christ, even though we're experiencing sorrow, we can also experience joy. Okay, third point. So first of all, we just talked about, this is a picture of the church as relationship. We learned a little bit about Epaphroditus. And the third point is some life lessons from Epaphroditus. Some life lessons. What can we learn from this guy that we know so very little about? And there's three things I think we can learn from him. The first one is that we may be called to sacrificial service. We may be called to sacrificial service. And for Epaphroditus, his commitment to Christ was more important to him than his own life. He risked his life for Christ. He was willing to die for the cause of Christ. Now, I read that, and I just kind of go, uh, you know, I'm not even in the same league. It's like Epaphroditus, he plays for the New York Yankees in Major League Baseball, and I'm in single-A baseball praying for the, playing for the Fort Wayne Tin Caps. That's a real team in, in single-A baseball, the Fort Wayne Tin Caps. That's my team. But Epaphroditus, I mean, he plays for the Yankees in the Major League. I mean, how can we compare ourselves to him? And so how would you respond if you were put in a place where you had to risk your life for the work of Christ? How do you think you would respond? How do I think I would respond? You know, I think often in the church we, you know, people balk at being asked to usher or, or they balk at being asked to be a part of children's church or host a house church, or serve on the admin board. And I think our perspectives are so skewed. Because for Paul and Epaphroditus, it meant suffering and persecution and maybe death. And for hundreds of thousands of people in our world today, to serve the cause of Christ can mean suffering or persecution or death. And we don't want to usher or we don't want to whatever it might be. Our perspectives are so skewed. We may be called to sacrificial service. About 25 years ago, there was a Baptist church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And it was a, it was a very conservative Baptist church in Grand Rapids. And this was during the AIDS crisis. And a lot of the churches in Grand Rapids were being very critical and judgmental toward the gay community. And this conservative Baptist church in Grand Rapids says, we feel called to something else. We feel called to love these people, to love the gay community. And they got involved in the lives of, of this community. And they ended up Really, what they ended up doing for a lot of times is that when, when somebody gay was dying of AIDS, often they were alone. And it was people from this church that would be there sitting with them, holding their hand, comforting them while they died. And within the gay community in Grand Rapids, that church became known as the church that loves us. That was their sacrificial service. They risked loving these people they had other churches that judged them and criticized them for doing it, but they said, this is what God has called us to do, and we're going to do it. Sacrificial service. I also think right now of, of one of our own, Dr. Joseph Cisse. He's at Connaught Hospital in Freetown. It's, it's the, the main government hospital in the country of, of Sierra Leone. He encounters patients with COVID, and he does not have the personal protective equipment that he needs. And so he is putting his life at risk daily if, if, or weekly, if not daily. He is having to trust God literally to keep him healthy. And so far he's done that when doctors that he's worked side by side with have died of COVID. I mean, that is sacrificial service. So my question for you, how can you this week or this fall 
sacrificially serve Christ by serving other people. How can you, right now, this fall, sacrificially serve Christ in your way? What might He be calling you to do? That's the first thing we can learn from Epaphroditus. Second thing we can learn is that we're often called to serve those we love. We're often called to serve those we love because Epaphroditus served Paul and he served the church in Philippi. And so to Paul, Epaphroditus, like I've already said, you know, he was my brother, my co-worker, my fellow soldier. To the Philippians, he was their messenger whom they sent to take care of Paul's needs. And Epaphroditus was, was love-struck with Paul and the church in Philippi, and that meant he served them. He did what needed to be done because he loved these people. It caused me to think this week, all my time here, I've seen hundreds of expressions of love-struck service. I've seen many of you over and over again, down through the years, do something out of love for somebody because you care about them so deeply and sometimes it costs you. I, I thought back to a number of years ago, Memorial Day, the phone rings at our house fairly early and it's somebody on the phone saying that their marriage is in terrible shape, serious shape, and would I come and help? It's Memorial Day, I got the day off, like, Okay. And so what I did, then I called one of our elders, and I said, so-and-so, their marriage is falling apart, they need some help, will you come with me? And this elder said, yes. And we went. And we spent the majority of the day trying to help this couple whose marriage was literally falling apart. Now, when I called the elder, he could have said, no, I'm busy, but because he was busy. But he says, yes, I can help. Where do we meet? That's love-struck service. I love this couple. He loved this couple. We wanted to do what we could do to help them that day when they were crying out in need. So what love-struck service can you render to your brothers and sisters in Christ this week? Is there somebody within our community of faith that you deeply love, that you care about, and is there something you can do to reach out to them? That's the question. That's the second lesson from Epaphroditus. And the third lesson is that expressing our feelings is okay. Expressing our feelings is okay. One thing we get out of this passage is that Epaphroditus deeply cared about the Philippians. So in verse 26, it says, Epaphroditus longs for all of you and is distressed because he heard you were ill. He's distressed and he's longing for the Philippians. He's distressed because they heard he was ill and he doesn't want them to carry that burden and he longs for them because he loves them and he wants to go back and be with them. And we know that he's distressed and he's longing for them because he expressed his feelings to Paul. Paul knew that. And that's why Paul could write it down in the letter. Epaphroditus had feelings. He expressed them to Paul, and Paul communicated them to the church in Philippi. All of us have feelings, right? We all have feelings. And some of you find it really, really easy to express your feelings, and some of you not. But God created us with feelings. In fact, God Himself has feelings. And if you read through the Bible, I mean, God's feelings come out all over the place. And so for us to be human, part of what it means to be human is to have feelings and to know how to express those feelings, like Epaphroditus does here. And then we have Paul. Paul is not afraid to express his feelings. Epaphroditus isn't, and Paul isn't. So in verse 28, Paul says, Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. 
I may have less anxiety. Paul struggled with anxiety. Here's this hard-charging, type-A personality, charismatic leader, Paul, who did all this phenomenal stuff, and he struggles with anxiety. And he tells us, he tells the whole church, if I can just get Epaphroditus back to you, I'm going to have less anxiety. It's not uncommon for leaders to feel anxiety, whether they're in the church, whether it's education, whether it's business, whether it's government. I mean, it's not uncommon, especially in this day and age, for those in leadership to feel anxiety. And Paul felt it, and Paul shared it. So I have feelings, you have feelings, we all have feelings. You know, do you stuff and deny them? Or do you identify and express them? And I just love it here how Epaphroditus cared deeply about the people in the church, and he wanted to get back to them. And it's caused me to ask myself and to ask you, are there people who are a part of our community that you deeply care about, that you love, and is it time for you to share how you love them or to share how you feel about them with them? So they know that. Because in this letter, Epaphroditus and Paul are both publicly sharing their feelings of love and affection for other people. And that's a good example for us. Who do we love? Who do we care about? Who do we have strong feelings about? And are we letting them know that? So the three lessons. We may be called to sacrificial service. We are often called to serve those we love, and expressing our feelings is okay. Discussion questions. just want to quickly go over this. These are questions that our house churches and groups will use. Here's an example of discussion questions from this text. What strikes you about the church being a living organism of vertical and horizontal relationships? Two, what strikes you about Epaphroditus' life? Three, what would sacrificial service look like for you? And four, what feelings are easy and or hard for you to express? Let's pray together. Take a few moments of silence. Just listen for the whisper of God or maybe it's the shout. What is he saying to you this morning? Holy Spirit of God, thank you for how you spoke to us, and I pray that you would continue speaking to us throughout the rest of this day and this week. Amen.